It is, of course, a massive shame that Native American civilizations got violently wiped out. And one reason it's such a shame is that we didn't get to see what these awesome nations would look like if they developed into a sort of medieval era. Well, today, I want to take a look at that geographically. What would the mainland area of the USA look like if we took the technology, conditions, and plants and animals of old world civilizations, painted them onto this geography, and gave each region their own kingdom and empire? This scenario is purely geographic determinism, and while I will be researching the economies and societies of many native peoples for this video, bibliography in the description, this isn't a scenario of if Native Americans had time to grow into these civilizations. We are just talking geography. So get ready and gargle that subscribe button till you spill it on your shirt. Going from east to west. The Northeast's biggest asset is their amazing natural harbors and rivers. While New England has poor farming, especially further north, the Mid-Atlantic states down to the Chesapeake Bay would serve as the region's breadbasket. Therefore, I think we'd see many cities grow up along the seaboard, potentially from the Chesapeake Bay up to Maine. They'd want to secure their big rivers, pacify inland peoples, and try to establish a position on the Great Lakes trade network, perhaps by building their own Erie Canal. Yeah, side note, a lot of this geography-based stuff has happened in our own modern timeline. Go watch a real-life lore video that's half an hour too long for that. So expect me to refer to many existing cities and features. So, I think this Northeast Empire would become the main merchant traders for the entire eastern seaboard, especially if they take or vassalize the maritime provinces of Canada. They have all the geography and timber resources to really control that niche. Now, a Northeast Empire would probably be in conflict with their neighbors south of the Chesapeake and the wild savages we Americans call Canadians. And they would definitely be fighting over Ohio. Why? Ohio unironically makes or breaks empires, but we'll talk about that soon. The Atlantic South is really good for large-scale agriculture. The main difficulty here is going to be the humid subtropical climate mixed with the massive amounts of wetlands on the lowland coastal plain. That's a recipe for endemic disease. So we'll probably see large cities pop up more inland, similar to our modern line of cities from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. The cities would have to form along this line at the edge of the Piedmont Plateau, because that's the furthest inland where the rivers are still navigable. So, considering that this region would have good agriculture and large cities spread out on their own separate rivers, I'm guessing we'd first see the region pop up with separate kind of city-state kingdoms along the rivers, looking like strips from the mountains to the coast. But over time, as roads start connecting this whole line of major cities, we might see large unifications of these kingdoms, or a conquest of the entire Piedmont line. After this, we might see the capital city and power changing around due to the region's politics and natural events, with time periods marked by separate dynasties or civil wars to control the Piedmont line. To the south, Florida is fascinating, even before the invention of methamphetamine. A lot of it is subtropical wetland, so again, disease problem. But if they develop resistance, or drain the swamps, only a couple cities could make this peninsula a powerhouse. First, its cylindrical shape like this makes it easy to defend on land. If you own the swamps of the southern tip, then your only land border is however far northward you can push. And maybe more importantly, the peninsula's location makes it a maritime gateway between the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico. One city, located around Miami or West Palm Beach, however far south you can go without being swallowed by the Everglades, would be the perfect pit stop for East Coast merchants. Then Tampa would be the first big stop into the Gulf of Mexico with its big natural harbor. If a Floridian kingdom decides to spec into land control, they might be able to push up into the Panhandle the Deep South, or maybe even to the mouth of the Mississippi River. If they go for the seas, though, then they could be the first state to colonize the Gulf Coast or the Caribbean, maybe even kickstarting their own kind of homegrown plantation economy. What? You can't have old world style history without everyone colonizing each other. Just up north, Appalachian Mountains run the length of what we've already talked about so far, so they're up in everybody's business. These mountains are big enough to provide a natural border, but low and lush enough to house a lot of people. The main features we want to focus on here are its valleys. The Tennessee and Shenandoah Valleys would likely be its largest population centers, and those valleys would need to build and maintain relationships with the clans controlling smaller, surrounding valleys. 
so it would be a bit isolated for small communities. But the mountains are not big enough to stop a motivated army by any means. I think we would see some large Appalachian states develop here, but loyalties of individual valleys could flip very easily based on the local politics. A consolidated Appalachian state could definitely spill out and conquer some of the surrounding plateau and lowlands. Maybe Shenandoah takes the Potomac and Chesapeake, or Tennessee attacks into Alabama, Georgia, and the Mississippi. But this brings me to the harsh reality that oftentimes mountain peoples get subjugated by larger lowland populations around them. So we may see these strong Shenandoah and Tennessee kingdoms become vassals to the surrounding Mississippian and Southern civilizations. Back up north, the Great Lakes will clearly become a massive trade network, neighbored to the south by the Midwest's great farmland. The Great Lakes region itself does not have good natural defenses around it to protect it, so we would not see a kind of Mare Nostrum Roman Empire of the Great Lakes, as cool as that would be to see. Instead, the lakes themselves offer isolating protection to its three major peninsulas. I think first we'd see small agricultural and maritime kingdoms pop up around Michigan and Ottawa, and massive port cities pop up in the narrow straits and inland extremes. So places like Buffalo, Detroit, Chicago, Green Bay, Duluth are all still on the table. It would be monstrously lucrative for other surrounding civilizations to try and take at least one of these cities so they could benefit from the Great Lakes trade. So yeah, I think that reinforces the idea that a Great Lakes kingdom would have to consolidate around its peninsulas, building a great navy to control trade and protect its coasts, and then they would have to worry about fortifying their simple land borders. If this kingdom were to become extremely powerful, I'm quite certain it would expand down south into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois for their great farmland and river access. Yes, Ohioans, you heard me right. Michigan conquers you here. <laughs> Just to the south, the entire Mississippi Basin is probably the single most significant feature of American geography. With one main river, half a dozen massive tributaries, and large swaths of good, diverse farmland, a civilization that develops here would greatly mirror that of China. Big population, large cities, a centralized bureaucratic government, and growing very powerful with its capacity to mobilize people and innovate. The Mississippians, who I'll say are centered at the ancient city of Cahokia, would genuinely be this continent's middle kingdom. The thing is, this valley is surrounded by people who might want to beat them up. The Great Lakes, Appalachians, the Deep South, Canadian Taiga peoples, and then, insanely important, the Great Plains. For its eastern edge, I think a united Mississippian civilization could quite easily vassalize some of the Appalachian states as a buffer, as well as the deep south in Mississippi and Alabama to secure this border. Depending on how numerous and powerful these eastern neighbors are, we might see the politics of Kentucky, Tennessee, and the deep south rely on ever-changing coalitions based primarily on their relationship with the Mississippians. Truthfully, Anywhere from Lake Ontario to Florida to Texas could immediately fall under the Mississippian Kingdom's sphere of influence because there are several ancient native cultural complexes that show just how interconnected these areas already were. And given enough time, we may see the entire eastern seaboard absorbed into this civilization. In conflict with the Great Lakes, I want to finally point out that Ohio and West Pennsylvania will become one of the single most important areas to hold in this region's geopolitics. It is the fertile crossroads connecting the Northeast, Great Lakes, and Midwest without having to cross the mountains. So Ohio objectively has that empire building skibbity riz, somebody tell Cody from Alternate History Hub right now. So I think it's fair to give most of the river basin to a single Mississippian civilization state that needs to work really, really hard to pacify its neighbors, lest they swoop down and take some of the cities on the floodplain and establish their own dynasties. But we're missing a very, very big aspect of this state. Yes, the Great Plains. It, think about it, we're basically placing a whole civilization of agricultural cities right next to the perfect conditions to create nomadic empires like the Xiongnu, Mongols, and Comanches. China struggled a lot with nomadic invaders, but they have mountains and deserts between them. The Mississippians don't even have that, and the line between fertile plains in the area's east to dry steppe in the west is very gradual and blurry. So the settled Mississippians and horse warlords are going to face a lot of intimate contact. And I think that means that they'll become extremely intertwined over time. 
I pledge my sword and bow to the universal Khan Pritzker. Realistically, we might see a back and forth where different technologies and tactics allow for the settled people to take more of the Great Plains for themselves than the horse warlords strike back and take swaths of territory, city after city. But as they get more used to working together in the same areas, we'll see a mixed society emerge. The nomadic horse warriors might develop into a kind of knightly class that travels around the empire, keeping order and deterring threats, while the large cities and river systems generate massive material wealth and surplus. I think the most pervasive issue that this area would see would be raiders from the north and west. Wherever the northern border will be, it'll be long and pretty much entirely open, and the Rocky Mountains region is suitable for pastoralist groups, really big and hard to penetrate into. So we may see the northern frontier be a kind of lawless zone, mixing the Mississippi Great Plains culture with those of the Canadian Taiga peoples until the Mississippians subsume them, as well as generational migrations when a big Rocky Mountains tribe pours down into the Great Plains and causes all sorts of havoc. But overall, with this symbiotic relationship between a grand civilization and the horse warlords, the Mississippian Khanate Kingdom could effectively attack anywhere, from the desert southwest into the Great Lakes and along the eastern seaboard to secure itself as the uncontested continental power. And if the phrase, tornado-worshipping Mississippian Khanate Kingdom, isn't the coolest thing you've ever heard, I don't know what to tell you. Now to the west, in the massive regions of the Rocky Mountains and the Great Basin. This is mostly rugged rocky mountains, basins of plains, shrubland, deserts, and rivers. The geography here is kind of like the area around the Altai Mountains, so it would probably play host to many different nomadic tribes. The harsher desert areas of Nevada, the Mojave, and the Colorado Plateau would probably host hardier, smaller tribes, kind of like the Bedouin peoples in the Middle East and North Africa, while the larger, more prosperous and dominant tribes would enjoy the grasslands and mountain forests of Colorado, Utah, Idaho, and Montana. But as I mentioned before, pastoral groups tend to shuffle around and displace each other over time, which would inevitably spill out into the mountain region's neighbors, and we'd probably see some nomadic dynasties carving swaths of the Great Plains and Mississippi basins for themselves. But several areas from Colorado to Washington are good for agriculture, with stable water sources and decent terrain and climate for farming. The Columbia River Basin, the Snake River Plain, Utah and Sevier Valleys, and maybe some small western areas of Nevada. Some towns and cities may pop up here, especially at convenient trade locations, but the isolation of these agricultural societies among many nomadic pastoralists makes me think that any cities or settled kingdoms would need to be subservient or in deep connection with the tribes around them, maybe besides the farming areas in the western part of this region, which are closer to the settled Pacific Coast peoples. So I'll put these settled states on the map, but know that they are deeply tied with the tribes around them. The Desert Southwest is super interesting, because we did see the rise of awesome native Puebloan city-states and homesteads. I think we'd see cities pop up on the waterways and defensive sites here, because they're going to be hemmed in by nomads and raiders from basically all sides. These heavily fortified, almost castle-like cities would collectively give rise to some states around the waterways here, but also, the desert southwest is going to be a massive trade route between Mississippi, California, and any states in Mexico. The central hub of it all, until some medieval Teddy Roosevelt builds a Panama Canal. For some reason, my imagination just loves the idea of these big fortified cities on the Gila, Animas, and Rio Grande rivers, but connected by extremely developed trade routes between the larger civilizations to their east and west. The southwest peoples might develop a reputation for being the kind of Silk Road merchants of their rugged desert environment, between the great Mississippian and powerful Californian empires. We all love to hate California. So I'm sad to say that California's probably the single most geographically advantaged area in the entire continent. Ugh. <laughs> we would probably see the rise of a few city-states around the Bay Area, where eventually they either join together or get united by one dominant city. Then they expand out into the Central Valley and control the farming settlements out there. Then they expand north into the mineral and timber-rich mountains in the Shasta region, and they're pretty much all set after that. 
I think their biggest issue would be raiders from surrounding areas, particularly from the northeast in the Shasta and Great Basin region, because the south and east are protected by deserts and mountains. After securing a proper Kali Empire the size of Mesopotamia, I think they'd go east into the Lake Tahoe area as a jumping off point for the trade into the Great Basin, then probably expand up the northern coast because of its incredible resources and lush environment, and then down south for San Diego, which would likely be the entryway for merchants traveling west along the Gila and Alamo rivers. Sorry Los Angeles, but no oil or aqueducts in this scenario. California has some of the best geography to build itself up as a self-sustaining land power that conquers up along its coast. The Pacific Northwest has an extremely lush strip of coastline with productive rivers, and as you go further north, maritime resources in the Puget Sound and Salish Sea will become more important as mountains start hugging the coast more. Truthfully, coastal Oregon would probably fall victim to California and Seattle. But the environment here is so lush that maybe it could have a populace large enough to assert its independence? And I mean this place is lush. This region provided such an abundance of resources that it allowed for the densest populations of native hunter-gatherers on the continent. They settled villages, had social hierarchy, and had enough free time to make this crazy unique art, all without needing agriculture. So we'd probably see a much stronger economy of managed wilderness resources here than any other place we've talked about. So expect forestry to be a big part of their pagan religion. Beyond that, it's safe to say that we'd see cities pop up on the coast and rivers, especially the massive Columbia River, as well as on the Puget Sound around where Seattle is. Considering that Seattle is kind of the midpoint between the lush southern Alaskan coast and California, we could expect this to be a big trade hub of Arctic and Pacific resources, complete with a fantastic natural harbor. So yeah, I think we can reasonably split this area between Seattle and California, particularly with Seattle sticking to the coasts. If they become powerful enough, maybe they can go east over the mountains and try to take the settled areas of the Columbia Basin. But realistically, I think they'd use their large population to settle up the northern British Columbian and Alaskan coasts. As time goes on for coastal Alaska here, I think they'd develop such a strong maritime culture that we may see, and brace for this, Alaskan Vikings. Sailing down the Pacific coast, fortifying the Channel Islands, raiding Californians at... Okay, that's pretty fucking awesome. This is my map of, quote, what would America look like with medieval civilizations? I know you disagree about something. You guys are too smart not to. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Please click on another video and I'll see you next time.